I thank you so much for that this morning. Lord, I pray over the message as we go through the kings of Judah and that you just touch our hearts with your word this morning, Lord. Amen. All right, kiddos, head for the hills, but I do need a six-year-old and a nine-year-old. Do I have that in the house? Christian, you're still nine, right? All right, come here, Christian. You get, I get to pick on you again. I know, you want to go play. Now you got to go stand here. I'll, all right, two seconds. Just give me two seconds, all right? No six-year-olds? Who, who can act like a six-year-old? All right, I, I know that. All right. <laughs> uh, come, here, come here, Jacob. Come here, Jacob. I was about to pick on Jacob and go, you know, you're about the size of a six-year-old, so you can, you can, be, my, you can be my six-year-old. Okay, all right. Does he look, does he look six? We, we have a cuter one. Get out of here. All right. All right. I'll, I'll keep this. You stand here with Christian, okay? All right. Now, I, I need a 39-year-old. Anybody 39? 39? Jerry, are you 39? Come here. Come here. Come here. You have a key role here. I need, come here. Come here. Come here. Hurry. I got to get these kids to, to, to their children's church. Key role. I need you to lay down. You're dead. This is Josiah. He's dead. All right? Nico, king of, king of Egypt, killed him. All right? He went out in the battle. I, my personal opinion is God just said, hey, go get killed because I need to get on with this thing, all right? So Josiah was such a great king, but he was 39 years old when he died, okay? I, I need a 25-year-old, 25. 25. Hey, give me, come here, come here. Okay, you Wait a minute. stand Wait a minute. here. No, yeah, come here. What's your name, sweetie? Claire, come here, Claire. You're going to be Jehoiakim and you're going to stand right here, all right? And this is Eliakim. We're going to change his name to Jehoiakim, all right? He's 25 years old. I need a 23-year-old guy. 23-year-old guy. 23-year-old guy. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. All right, Tanner. You are Jehoahaz, all right? <laughs> this is big brother, 25 years old, all right? Dad's 39 dead, all right? Older brother, middle, all right? And this is oops, brother, all right? Amen? <laughs> Amen? Y'all with me? All right, so 25, 23, 9, okay? All right, and then this, this is the child of here. Now, I need somebody 40-ish. Come here. Come here, Mark, you're close enough. We'll, we'll pretend like you're 40. This is, this is crazy Uncle Jeremiah, okay? Now, come here, come here, come here, because you can't be with the family, oh. all right? Because you're crazy Uncle Jeremiah who has just been going and going and going, telling everybody, you got to repent, you got to repent, you got to repent, all right? Now, Josiah was all with you, all right? But he died, right? So now you got the kids to deal with, all right? Now, when Josiah dies, all right? Now, here's, this is Mataniah. We'll see you next week, all right? Get out of here. Claire, you go. We'll see you next week, too. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. All right? So thank, give, give him a hand. Give him a hand. So if you want to catch up with me, I'm in 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36. So we got dead Josiah. 39 years old. We've got older brother, Eliakim, all right, 25 years old. Middle or younger brother, all right, Jehoahaz, 23 years old. If you look at the text, it says, Then the common people, or the people of the land, took Jehoahaz, son of Josiah, and made him king in Jerusalem in the place of his father. Now, is that supposed to happen? Yeah, what happened to you? Good question. They don't like you, all right? The people of the land, the common people, came, and they made Jehoahaz king instead. Now, why in the world would they do something like that? Okay, now, I'm a younger brother, okay? I have an older brother. His name is Johnny. He is awesome. Love my older brother, okay? But we're very different people, 
extremely, you, if he walked in the room, you would have no guess, no clue that it was my brother, all right? He's about five foot eight, all right? He's bigger than me. I won't go into numbers, all right? He is a football coach, a track coach, all right? He loves doing that. That's his thing. He loves being at school. He's the guy that drives the bus, washes the uniforms, cleans up the locker room, just does everything. He's just that guy at school that every time you look up, he's doing something else, all right? And he loves doing it, okay? That's not me, okay? We're very different and very gifted in different ways. If somebody said, hey, we need somebody to be in charge and pastor a church or do something, they would probably look to me because my brother, that's just not him, all right? Now, for whatever reason, the people of the land went, this guy's awesome. Let's make him king. So let's see how it turns out. You doing okay, Jerry? You're awesome, man. <laughs> Academy Award back there. Verse 2, Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned for three months. Woohoo! Three whole months in Jerusalem. The king of Egypt deposed him in Jerusalem and fined the land 7,500 pounds of silver and 75 pounds of gold. Then Necho, king of Egypt, made Jehoahaz brother Eliakim king over Judah and Jerusalem and changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. But Necho took his brother Jehoahaz and brought him to Egypt. So see ya, gone, we're out of here. And Necho gets rid of him, takes him to Egypt. And then Necho says, you're now the king. Now, why would you do this? You got to think about it. Why would you take one king and go, get out, and now I'm going to pick. The people of the land chose Jehoahaz. Now, I'm going to pick. And not only am I going to pick you, but I'm going to change your name because the person who changes a person's name has ownership of that person, right? Your name has value. When you change someone's name, say like from Saul to Paul, they own you. From Simon to Peter, that person owns you. And so what Nico was doing, Nico was saying, I own you, and I'm going to name you. So we went from Eliakim, which means El, Elohim establishes, to Jehovah establishes. Any big change there? No, but who named him? Nico. So who owns him? Nico does. All right? Good. Now, Get out of here. Good job. Good job, Jerry. You're good. You're good. All right. Now, we still got crazy Uncle Jeremiah over here, okay? Now, he's going to start in about the 13th year, right? About the 13th year of jo Josiah's reign. About the time he starts to clean out everything, Jeremiah steps in, and he says, look, I'm just a kid. I'm a youth. I'm a nar. all right? This is this idea that he was probably about 16, 16 to 18 years old. And now we're 18 years down. And for what all this time, he's been saying, Josiah, you got to get your people right. Josiah, you got to get them to turn away from the Baals and turn away from the idols and turn and turn and turn and, and come back to me. And if, you will own, if they will do this, then I will relent from the disaster that I'm going to get put on them. And so Josiah has been listening to Jeremiah, and he's done well. But here's my question. How's Jehoiakim doing? With Jeremiah. How is Jehoiakim doing? What is Jehoahaz? Jehoahaz steps in and becomes king and does evil immediately. Why? What's he even thinking about doing a whole reign of his father? How his father was turning away from all the idols, but Jehoahaz was sitting there thinking what? Can't wait till he dies off. We can get back to worshiping the Baals, the Asherah. Big Brother was the same way. So Big Brother Jehoiakim, who we'll talk about today, and Jeremiah had a unique relationship, I'm guessing. I don't think Jehoiakim liked Jeremiah very much. And that was that crazy uncle that Dad kept around all this time. They couldn't do anything to him. So these are the players in our little play today. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. All right? So again, I want you to get this, or get this thought in your head so you know you can identify with these characters. <clears throat> so um, let's talk Jeremiah real quick. Because one of the things he says, if you'll go to Jeremiah 1, if you have trouble finding it, that's a problem. 
but that's okay. We're going to work on that today. In Jeremiah 1, it's really interesting. Jeremiah is called, and this is when we get the verse, I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart. Before you were born, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. God say, and Jeremiah goes, I'm just a boy. I'm just a nar. I'm a youth. I'm 16, 17, 18 years old. This is the same as when David goes out and fights Goliath. He says, you're just a youth. What can you do? I'm just a boy. All right? And so Jeremiah is called at this point. And then you roll into chapter 2, and then 2.13 is a key, key, key verse for our understanding of the condition of Judah, of Jerusalem, under the reign of Jehoiakim. Okay? In 2.13, Jeremiah says this, For my people, and he's speaking, God, God is speaking to Jeremiah, go tell them this, For my people have committed a double evil. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, okay, the spring, all right? Anybody ever been to Round Springs? I grew up around a place called Wakulla Springs. Anybody watch the old Tarzan movies, Creature from the Black Lagoon? Some of y'all old school enough for this, all right? That's where they filmed all this. It's a spring, and it was just constantly replenishing itself, okay? So they have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that cannot hold water. So he, Jeremiah goes, and this is his proclamation that he's going to give for 20-something years. He's going to give this proclamation. My people have abandoned me, and, and I'm the fountain of living water. If you need water, is a fountain a good thing? Yeah. Can you outdrink the fountain? No, it's going to be constantly replenished. Any of you ever been to one of these springs? Can you see into the water? How clear is the water in a spring? I, I remember at this Wakulla Springs, this is right outside of Tallahassee, they used to have this tower, and the top tower was like 30 feet high, and you could jump off the towers, all right? It, go look at 30-foot tower. It's not a lot of fun, all right? It's a little scary, all right? But you could stand up at the tower, and you could look down into the actual spring, and, I mean, you could see like 100 feet deep in this thing, all right? So he says, they've abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they've dug cisterns for themselves. Now, when you have a city, a walled city, you need to dig a cistern. That way, when it rains, all this stuff, your water can come in there. You can stay fresh. You can have water for you. But what kind of cisterns are they? They dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns. Well, what just happened to your fresh drinking water now that your cistern is cracked? What seeps in? all the dirt, all the sediment, all this. So now you, do, you throw your bucket down in your well, and what do you get? A big pile of mud. And this is the condition that, that Jeremiah is speaking into for 25 years. As he talks to Josiah, and as he talks to Jehoiakim eventually, eventually he's going to talk to Zedekiah as well. We'll get to him next week. But this is what he's speaking into them. So over and over and over, we have this, this conflict of, Purge yourself from all this stuff. Purge yourself from all the evils. Purge yourself. And all there, Jehoiakim is sitting there watching all this and thinking what? What's he thinking? Just crazy Uncle Jeremiah. Just can't believe Dad's actually listening to him. So Jehoiakim is eventually going to come to power when he's 25 years old. And it's not going to go well for him. Since you're there in Jeremiah, come on over here. Now, Jump over to 26. Now, here's what you got to know about Jeremiah. Uh, picture a, a, okay, you're in college, okay? Some of you college students, y'all, y'all can be with me on this one, all right? You're in college. You've got your master's thesis, your thesis, whatever, all right? It, it's like 50, 60 pages, all right? And you finally got, you print it off, and you're heading to your professor's class, and, and you're going to turn in your thesis. It's, it's all done. And as you're running frantically to get there because you overslept, all of a sudden you trip, and guess what happens to all the papers? They go everywhere, okay? But you have the bottom page and the top page still in your hand from the fall, okay? And you look down, and there's pages everywhere, and so you start to scoop them up and frantically put them together. You got the top and you got the bottom, and you just go, I pray they made it all back in the right spot. And you go to the professor, and you go, I'm done, That's Jeremiah, okay? 
I'm just telling you, if you try and synthesize, if you try and figure out the order of it, you're going to go insane, okay? It's just jumbled up. And so we go from here to here to here to here to here. I don't know why I'm not in charge of writing the Bible or editing. I'm just telling you what it is, okay? So in, in chapter 26, we get these words. At the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's temple and speak all the words I've commanded you to speak to all Judah's cities that are coming to worship there. Who's the audience? He's going to the courtyard of the temple. In the first year, the, right at the beginning of Jehoiakim's reign, all right, he's going to the temple. He says, speak the words. Who's the audience? Is it the king? Is it the pretty people? Is it the smart people? It's everybody. We need to get this. This Bible was not written for theologians and preacher people like me. This Bible was written for you. This Bible was, was written down and preserved for thousands of years so you can read it. Not so I can read it and tell you what to think about it. And any pastor that stands up here and says, don't worry about your own, you just listen and I'll tell you what it means. That's a dangerous, dangerous person right there. Be careful of people like that, all right? But this Bible, this, this word was communicated so that all the people could hear it. He says, do not hold back a word. I love this word in verse three. Perhaps. Everybody say, perhaps. perhaps. What kind of word is that? Why, why would God use the word perhaps? What are you saying when you say the word perhaps? I'm going to do this. Perhaps, it means what? I'm not sure what's going to happen. Well, we know God knows what's going to happen. But what does he do? He puts us out there because God does not always operate in this, you will do this, and here's it structured, and this is a script, and you will stick to the script. God says, you know what? Perhaps, speak all these words. Perhaps they will listen and return each from his evil way of life so that I might, why would God might do something or might not do something? Isn't the script already laid out there? Well, evidently not in God's eyes that I might relent concerning the disaster that I plan to do to them because of the evil of their deeds. You were to say to them, this is what the Lord says, if, there's another word in there, well, what if not? If there's an if, there's got to be an if not. So we got perhaps, we got might, we got if into this whole thing. How settled is all of this? How scripted is this whole thing? Is there free will? Is there free choice in all of this? If you do not listen to me by living according to my instruction that I set before you and by listening to the words of my servant, the prophets, I've been sending to you time and time again. Remember that. I'll come back to that in a second. Though you did not listen, I will make this temple like Shiloh. Shiloh was where the, the tabernacle was set up and God wiped it out. I will make this city an object of cursing for all the nations of the earth. And what did the people do with Jeremiah as he proclaimed this message? Perhaps you will turn and I'll relent from all this disaster. They went, tell us more, Jeremiah. No. They said, he's got to die. He needs to die. And what's interesting, it's the prophets, the other prophets and the priests who are the ones saying, he's got to die. The officials, the government types said, I don't think so. I don't see what he's done wrong here. What are you so worked up about? Because these prophets were working against him, not with him. Come over here to 25. Like I said, we were in 26. We're going to go backwards here in the text, but we're actually going forward in time, okay? Like I said, just remember, Jeremiah, that kid that throws his thesis everywhere and just puts it back together, so you got to put page to page. In verse chapter 25, this is the word that came from Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah. Remember, this is not a message exclusively for the big people, all right? In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the prophet Jeremiah spoke concerning all the people of Judah and all the residents of Jerusalem as follows. 
from the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, for 23 years, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I've spoken to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed. The Lord sent all his servants, the prophets, to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed or even paid attention. Real quick, this idea of time and time again, the literal translation is, he rose early and began sending out prophets. He rose early and began to send out. I want you to understand, that's who your God is. Your God is not a God who goes, yes, they're not going to do anything. Why bother? Think about the person who gets up in the morning. Any morning people in the house? I'm a morning person, but as long as I'm alone, if there are other people, I'm like, I'm out. All right? I got to go find somewhere quiet. All right? But I like to get up in the morning. I like to get up and get, get my day going. Okay? That's just the way I am. All right? It, but this is your God. He rises early and sends out. Why? That's a hopeful person. That's an optimistic person. He gets up and he goes, let's get to work. There's work to be done. There might be a chance that perhaps today is the day they will turn and repent. So time and time again, when you read that, think he rose up early because he knew today just might be the day. Verse 5. He announced, turn each of you from your evil way of life and from your evil deeds. Live in the land the Lord gave you and your ancestors long ago and forever. Do not follow the gods and serve them and worship them. And do not provoke me to anger by the works of your hand. Then I will do you no harm. But you would not obey me. In order that you might provoke me to anger by the works of your hand and bring disaster on yourselves. Therefore, this is what the Lord of hosts says. When you see Lord of hosts, think the Lord that will mess you up. All right? He's, that means the host, that means the army, that means all the full army, the Lord of the army, the God that will mess you up. Do not mess with me. Do not provoke me. I will mess you up, all right? So therefore, this is what the Lord who will mess you up says, because you have not obeyed my words, I'm going to send for all the families of the north and send for my servant, Nebuchadnezzar which I love because God refers to the most powerful king on the planet at this time as he's my servant. He does what I tell him to do, all right? My servant, king of Babylon, I will bring them against this land. And you got to you understand this. Habakkuk told him this would happen 50 years earlier, all right? It's like one guy's writing this whole thing. It's really cool. And I will bring them against this land, against the residents, against all those surrounding nations, and I will completely destroy them and make a desolation, a derision, and ruins forever. I will eliminate the sound of joy and gladness from them, the voice of the groom and the bride, the sound of the millstone, and the light of the lamp. The whole land will become a desolate ruin, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. When 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon, that nation, the land of the Chaldeans for their guilt, and I will make it a ruin forever. I will bring on that land all my words to have spoken against it, all that is written in this book that Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings will enslave them, and I will repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. That's the plan. You know why? Because the Lord knows the plans he has for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That sounds familiar, right? It's going to be written 10 years later after God carries out the beginning of this plan. He says, listen, 70 years are determined for you, so you better get comfy. You're going to be 70 years in timeout, all right? Anybody put their kids in timeout? Israel got put in timeout, or Judah got put in timeout for 70 years. God said, you sit there and you think about what you did, all right? But this is what he's saying, but he keeps to going back out there, and he keeps going out there. Why? What kind of God keeps rising early and sending out prophets? One who loves his people and does not want to see them go through the pain that they're about to go through. So guess what? He gets up every morning, and he sends out people to turn you back to your God. 
He rises early and sends people out. And he rises early and he sends people out. And he rises early and he sends you out. Because perhaps today might just be the day that you turn to him and become all that he needs you to be. And he sends these prophets. Now look at 36. Go over to Jeremiah 36. We'll keep going in the story. I told y'all it's, it's just everywhere, all right? Here's a specific episode. Again, we're in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. This is 605 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar has laid siege to the city. God, remember, God said, I'm bringing my servant against you. I'm bringing the nations from the north. Habakkuk is told 50 years earlier, you're not going to believe what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring these pagan nations to destroy my people. I say it's like inviting the kid next door to come and beat the snot out of your kid because he's been disobeying. Imagine what it would take to get you there, all right? That's what God does with Judah. In chapter 36, and forgive me for reading too much today, it's just that there's, there's good stuff here. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, take a scroll, some of your translations may say book, all right, same idea, same idea, don't get weird, all right? Take a scroll, write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the nations from the time I spoke to you during Josiah's reign until today, okay? Now, if, if you kind of break down Jeremiah, what you find, it's the first 20 chapters. So basically, 1 through 20 is what he's going to write down at this point, okay? Because there's other stuff that's all thrown in there in the middle of all that. I just want you to kind of see that. So it's Jeremiah 1 through 20. He writes all this down. Why? Come on, why? 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 800 years. Imagine your kids disobeying you for five minutes. What are you doing? Are you rising early and hoping that everything's going to go well? Or are you rising early to wear them out? All right? It's 800 years. We're talking 1,400 as they come out of Egypt until the present day, 605. God has been rising early and sending out prophets to turn them back to him. That is your God. If you have this imagery of God just sitting up there throwing lightning bolts at me, just wrecking my day, giving me flat tires, making the air conditioner break, the oven didn't work, it couldn't cook the turkey, anybody's power go out this week, all right? Had to fix that clock 12 times this week. Just, why, God, why are you doing this to me? He's going, I don't know why you, you think I'm doing all. I'm rising early and I'm sending prophets into your life. And I've had them write down all the words that I speak to you so that you can read them every day. You can renew your mind. <clears throat> Verse 3, here's our word again. Perhaps. Write down all the words I've spoken. Perhaps. Perhaps when the house of Judah hears about all the disaster that I'm planning to bring on them, each one of them, not the king, not the pretty people, not the special people, each one of them will turn from his evil way. Then I will forgive their wrongdoing and their sin. The end, everybody's happy, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, right? That's the plan. Write the scroll, let everybody read it, they'll turn, boom, awesome. I'll relent, I'll forgive. This is my desire. So Jeremiah summoned Baruch, son of Neriah. At Jeremiah's dictation, Baruch wrote on a scroll all the words that the Lord had spoken to Jeremiah then Jeremiah commanded Baruch, I am restricted. I cannot enter the temple of the Lord. All right, because what happened last time he went there? Come on, we just read it. What happened last time he went to the temple? They tried to kill him, okay? He's going, uh, maybe not, may not a good, be a good idea for me to go, all right? I'm restricted. I cannot enter the temple. So you must go and read from the scroll, which you wrote at my dictation, the words of the Lord and the hearing of the people at the temple of the Lord, on a day of fasting, what's the mood of everyone on a day of fasting? Well, let me say this, theoretically, you know, hungry, all right, about how you're feeling right now, right? 1210, 
You get, you're getting a little hungry. You've been fasting all morning, all right? Or at least since, what, nine you've been fasting, all right? But what is theoretically the mood of the people? When you fast, what do you do? I, I forego eating so that I can pursue the mind, the heart, the knowledge of God. So he's reading this to them at the temple on a day of fasting. That should be an easy crowd, right? This should not be hard. They should hear this and they go, oh, we will do whatever you say. Keep going. You must also read them in the hearing of all the Judeans who are coming from their cities. Again, seven. Why? Because perhaps. What kind of God keeps going to the well on this thing? Go talk to him one more time. Go talk to him one more time. You see, you serve a God who loves you so much that he rises early every day and sends prophets into your life. You know why? Because perhaps today is a day you get your stinking pride out of the way and you become what God needs you, wants you, desires for you to be. Perhaps. Perhaps their petition will come before the Lord and each one will turn from his evil way for the anger and the fury that the Lord has pronounced against the people are great. So Baruch, son of Neriah, did everything Jeremiah the prophet commanded him at the, in the Lord's temple. He read the Lord's word from the scroll. Now this takes place, keep going with the text. In the fifth year, so it took him about a year to write this, in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, in the ninth month, that's about this time, all right, all the people of Jerusalem and those coming in from Ju Judah's cities into Jerusalem proclaimed a fast before the Lord. It wasn't a scheduled fast. It was a people said, we got a fast. My impression is there's a big army led by Nebuchadnezzar right outside your door. Maybe time to fast, okay? Verse 10, then at the Lord's temple in the chamber of Gemariah, son of Shaphan, the scribe. Yo, we remember he was there last week, right? He's the one that found the book. Oh, Hilkiah found the book. Hilkiah went, Shaphan, look, we found this book. And it, Shaphan goes and shows it to Josiah, the book of the law that Moses had written. <clears throat> so he reads this in the upper courtyard of the opening of the new gate of the Lord's temple in the hearing of all the people. Why? One more time. Because it's not for the kings. It's not for the pretty people. It's not for the priests. God loves all of us enough to write down and record all of his beautiful words for us to do what with? Carry around with us? Read it, read it, all right? 11, I love this guy. When Micaiah, son of Gemariah, this is the grandson of the guy that read the book of the law to Josiah and he tore his garments. His grandson, I wonder how many times Shephan told Micaiah that story. Heard all the words of the Lord from the scroll. He went down to the scribe's chamber in the king's palace. All the officials, now these are sort of the political officials. All the officials were sitting there. I'm not gonna name all those guys. It's all those guys, all right? Verse 13, Micaiah reported to them all the words he heard when Baruch read from the scroll in the hearing of the people. Do you understand this? Micaiah is sitting here, and he's listening to these words, and he's going, oh, my goodness, that might just happen. That could possibly happen to us. And he is moved, and his heart is changed. And, and he's profoundly affected by the words of God, just like you are every single morning, Right? You are just like Micaiah every single morning when you read the words of God. Thirteen, Micaiah reported all the words that he had heard when Baruch read from the scroll in the hearing of the people. Then all the officials sent word to Baruch uh, through Jehudi. I got like that name. Don't name your kid that, by the way. All right, if anybody's pregnant in the house, Jehudi, bad name. All right. Son of Nethaniah, son of Shelemiah, son of all those guys, saying, bring the scroll that you read in the hearing of all the people and come. So Baruch, son of Neriah, took the scroll and went to them. They said to him, sit down and read it in our hearing. So Baruch read it in the hearing of the officials. When they heard all the words, when the officials, when the, the, the higher ups, when the important people heard the words of the Lord. Why? Because they were read to them. They turn to each other in fear and said to Baruch, 
we must surely tell the king all these words. I wonder what the tone was. Oh, we got to tell the king all this. Or we got to tell the king all these words. Now, Jehoiakim, how receptive do you think he's going to be? How receptive do you think Jehoiakim is going to be to crazy Uncle Jeremiah's words? <clears throat> then they asked Baruch, tell us, how did you write all these words? At his dictation? Yep, at his dictation. He recited all these words. Verse 19 says, the official said to Baruch, you and Jeremiah, go hide. Why? Because they knew exactly what was going to happen. You better go hide. Baruch, take Jeremiah. Y'all, y'all got to go hide. Tell no one where you are. Then they came to the king of the courtyard, having deposited the scroll in the chambers of Elishama, the scribe, and reported everything to, in the hearing of the king. Verse 21, the king sent Jehudi to get the scroll, and he took it from the chamber of Elishama, the scribe. Jehudi then read it in the hearing of the king and all the officials who were standing by the king. Since it was the ninth month, the king was sitting in his winter quarters with a fire burning in front of him. As soon as Jehudi would read three or four columns, Jehoiakim the king would cut the scroll with the scribe's knife and throw the column into the blazing fire until the entire scroll was consumed by the fire in the brazier. Just let that sink in for a second. The word of God, the God who rises early and sends out his prophets to speak to his people, to turn their hearts back to him, And as it's being read, Micaiah was profoundly affected. I've got to tell the officials. The officials reacted with fear and trembling. Said, we've got to tell the king. And they go to the king, and the king sits there, and he listens to it. And as it comes, he rips it out, and he throws it in the fire. Cuts it out, throws it in the fire, until it's all gone. Look at how this plays out. As they heard, verse uh, 24, as they heard all these words, the king and all his servants did not become terrified. No fear. No fear at all. They did not tear their garments. Even though Elanatha, Deliah, Gamariah had urged the king not to burn the scroll, he would not listen to them. Then the king commanded Jeremiah, the king's son, Sarai, uh, so all these guys, to seize Baruch and Jeremiah, but the Lord had hidden them. This God who rises early sends out his prophets. He said, write all the words on a scroll. Go read it in the hearing of the people because they need to know what the consequence of their actions are going to be. They need to understand and they need to turn from their wicked ways that I'm going to define for them. And they need to return to me so that I will relent because they have provoked me to anger. For 800 years, they've been provoking me, and I've been holding off. I've been holding off, but this is the end, all right? He's like a really bad parent. You've heard that parent before. One more time, and I'm going to, and you're all going, okay, bring him over here. I'll beat him for you if you need me to, all right? But, but God is such a loving, loving God, and he knows what this disaster is. He knows what his wrath is going to be. He says, I perhaps today. Let's get up in the morning and let's send out more, perhaps today. So this scroll is there, and it's right there in the reading of Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim is sitting there with his arms folded, and he hears it, and he takes a knife, and he just slices it and throws it in the fire. Keep reading. Go ahead. All right. Throws it in the fire. I want to tell you about four types of people when it comes to the Scriptures. And you're going to find yourself in one of these categories. They're the first one. And, and they're, they're really similar to, um, to Jehoiakim here. And, and they take Jeremiah 1 through 20. And they just tear it out. Now, I don't want to be provocative just for the sake of being provocative. That's exactly what he was doing. 
but, I, but I want you to know, this Bible has been sitting in the lost and found since I got here three years ago. Because you see, there are certain types of people who will just take the Bible and they will throw it away, and it will mean absolutely nothing to them. It's who they are. It's who they want to be, and it means absolutely nothing. The second type of people, they generally dress really nice. They walk into a building on Sunday mornings. Again, they're very nice people, and they carry this book around with them, at least on Sundays when they come to the building. And then they go home, and they put the, the book, they put it down in a very safe and nice place. And then next Sunday, if or when they come to church, they pick up the book, and they bring it with them. And they do this for 40, 50, 60 years. And the book has no effect on their life whatsoever because they don't read it. When God wakes up, rises early every morning and sends this book into your lap, and you just ignore it, and you don't read it, what effect is it? Now, some of you are thinking, well, at least I'm not that guy. Well, I think the revelation is pretty clear on this. God says, I would rather you be hot or cold, but your lukewarm self that walks into this building once a week, looking nice, acting respectfully, being very polite and kind to everyone you know, but you don't know anything about me. And frankly, you wouldn't even know that Jeremiah 1 through 20 wasn't even in here because you've never read it. There's a third kind of person. This is, I think, where a lot of us might fit in here in this category. We wake up every morning. Man, we want to have that quiet time. We go, all right. Uh, all right, God, I need this, 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 and this. Okay, got to go. We get our chapter for the day in. And, 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 and I mean, these are, the, these are the, the honor students in the class. Y'all with me? If you get your chapter for the day in, you're an honor student in church world. But James says we should be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Guys, reading a chapter a day is not a Bible reading plan. That's a checklist that somebody gave you so that you can feel spiritual. That is not what you do with a book that was given to you because God loves you and wants to, you to know how much he loves you. How many of you, you got that love note back, back in, when we used paper and pen to write letters? Y'all know, they don't have a clue. They're like, oh, oh. When, when you put stamps on it. Lauren, when you, when you got that letter from William and, and you started reading it, did you go, okay, first paragraph, I'll come back to it tomorrow? Did you go, oh, I think I'll read that. Oh, I don't know if I have time. I don't know if I have time to read that second paragraph. Maybe I'll get to it tomorrow. What do we, what do, we do? What did we do with it? You know, I had a pen pal. I met a girl at basketball camp. She was at cheerleading camp in 10th grade. We wrote back and forth to each other for six years. The last letter I got from her was, I, I'm engaged now. I guess we should probably not write anymore. I was like, all right, that's fair. All right. We wrote back and forth. Did I ever, like, Lauren, did I ever do, you know, I'll get this first paragraph in. Yeah, a couple of days later, I'll get the second paragraph in. No. What did we do with those letters? We just consumed them. We knew somebody loved us enough to write us a letter, and we just consumed it. That takes me to the fourth category. I call it the Thanksgiving reader, because how many of y'all sat down at Thanksgiving lunch, dinner, whatever you did, you sat down, you got your loose pants on, all right, and you just gorged yourself for about 45 minutes, and you, you kind of got up from the table and kind of waddled around because you were so full because you just consumed as much as you possibly could. And in your, in your fullness 
and in your just, I can barely move, kind of making my way to the couch, somebody goes, we got pie, and you went, whoop, I can still make a little bit of room over here, especially with Jeannie's pies, all right? That's the kind of people I want you to be when it comes to the scriptures. L- let me be real. I'm not a big fan of the read through the Bible in a year plan. I'm just not. It's too chopped up. It's, it's too separated for me. I don't, I just, I'm not a big fan of it. If you want to do it, I'm, I'm all for you. What I want to do and what I want from you, I want you just to read. Sit down for an hour and just read. You, you, you know you're allowed to do that, right? We didn't put the chapters in here so that means you got to stop for the day. That's just to help you find stuff. Sit down and consume this book. You know why? Because perhaps you might be the person God wants you to be when you finish it. Perhaps you'll be the father you need to be. When you read the works of a God who rises early and sends out his prophets to tell you all he is and to turn your back to him, turn you, turn you back to him, you may be the mom you need to be. Perhaps the answers are in here. Perhaps knowing God is found right here. And you guys struggle, and you, and you know why? Because you've never opened it. Because you walk into a building, and you're really nice, and your book sits like this 99.99% of the time. You should have to buy a new Bible at least every five years because you wear the thing out. You know why? Because perhaps you might become the person God wants you to be. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now that we would all look very closely in the mirror. That we would take an honest look at ourselves and our own lives. And because God, most of us in this room have been reading for a while. We've had the ability to read. We've had the ability to comprehend written words for a long time. And yet we still don't know you. And God, we we may not be the people. We may not be like the Jehoiakims who just, who hate the words that you're speaking to us. Oh, Father, but I don't think we're the people that love the words that you speak to us. Because if we did, we'd be different people. We'd have different habits. We would know more of you. We would understand your character more. And we would be beautiful people in our families, our schools, and our communities. So, Father, may we look closely. May we look closely at our own lives. May we consider carefully what we have done with the words that you've compelled the prophets, the apostles, to write. And may we just understand for a moment the fact that we can hold 2,600 year old words in our hands and we can read them and consume them that that we can read 3,500 year old law and history that we can read 3,000 year old poems that we can read 2,000 year old letters written from the greatest apostle to a little church plant in Colossae. Father, may we recognize what we have. And may we hunger and may we thirst for more of the word that you rose early in the morning, that you send us out. 
just because you said perhaps today they will read it. Oh, Father, challenge our hearts. Challenge our hearts with that today, Father. We're going to sing a final song. And again, I, I want you to stand. I want us to sing this song. But I want you to think, think deeply. What have I done with the word of God? And what will I do with it tomorrow?